A few days ago, a very kind person indicated to me by email that he wanted to nominate me for a major prize. And he said that he felt I deserved it, that it would bring credit to the University of British Columbia. At first, I was flattered, but I replied that um, I'd rather him consider nominating a younger person, preferably a woman. You see, I've been very fortunate in my life to win more than my share of prizes and awards and medals over the years. I would rather see other people honored. Don't get me wrong, I'm just like anybody. It's really nice to get awards and medals, and it's, uh, I have a lot of wonderful memories about ceremonies and nice dinners that come with those sorts of awards. But I actually think that awards go to the same people far too often, and they should be spread to more people. In particular, far too many awards go to men. Yesterday was a very important day. It was International Women's Day, and so that's the topic of my brief talk today. Hashtag nominate her. Last year, Canadian optical physicist Donna Strickland who was at the time an associate professor, won the Nobel Prize in physics. It was a great day for physics. It was a great day for Canada. She got it for work that she had done in a field of study that I don't quite understand called pulsed lasers. And it was work that she had done as a relatively young trainee. It was great news. But it was also noteworthy in that she was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize in physics in 55 years, and only the third one ever to win a Nobel Prize in physics. Of the more than 900 Nobel Prize winners that have won this top award over the years, only 50 have been women. The Nobel categories with the highest percentage of winners our literature, and peace. And in those categories, the chance that you will win if you're a woman is only 12.5%. Only one-eighth of the total number of winners that have ever won those awards. And those are the awards that are the most likely to be granted to a woman. In physics and economics, the situation is much worse. Only 1% of winners have been women. As you heard, there hasn't been one in physics for 55 years. But the Nobel Prizes are not the only example of gender inequity in this world. This graph from the Wall Street Journal showcases the number of female CEOs that head Fortune 500 companies, the largest and most influential companies on the multinational scene. You can see, yes, there has been improvement, but not nearly as much as there should be. If you look at the demographics of students studying business at institutions like UBC, or the Ivy League, or Oxford or Cambridge, in many cases, the majority of students are women. So you can see that although it has risen, as of 2014, and now this year, only 23 to 25 of the Fortune 500 CEOs are women. But let's look at the arts. Let's look at the Oscars. Across all the categories, there have been more male winners than female nominees. Think about that for a second. Catherine Bigelow is the only woman to win a Best Director Oscar in the entire 90-year history of the award. In fact, only five women have ever been nominated for the Best Director category. And it's not because women are not good directors or producers of films, because they are. And the situation is the same elsewhere in the world. There have been very few women to win the British BAFTA Awards. 
The same biases, the gender inequality, occurs in the field of music. This graph shows the percentages of men and women who have become directors of major orchestras or conductors. Despite the fact that if you go to the great music schools and conservatories of the world, there are women, in most cases, more women than men. Only 5% of the directors of major orchestras are women, and only 9% of the conductors have been female. So what can we do to address this fundamental problem that exists around the world? Well, there is a solution. Either deliberately nominate more women. Because if you don't nominate women for awards and positions and jobs, they have no chance of winning. Or do something that's happened in the music world. Go to gender-blind selection processes. I'll explain that for a second. It works in classical music. The number of female performers in music schools and conservatories and orchestras has been rising over the years. In fact, there's a majority in most of the elite music schools around the world. The increase can be attributed in terms of orchestras in the use of something called blind auditions, where candidates, usually young trainees from music schools, are listened to in a blind manner, where the jury are separated by a screen from the performer, making it impossible for the jury to determine the gender of the candidate. In fact, something else was uh, interesting in this process. They found that actually some of the judges could actually tell the gender, even behind the screen, by listening to the sound of the shoes on the stage. And so, at some point, candidates were asked not to wear heels, because the clacking of heels could identify them, their gender, to the judges behind the screen. And in studying those statistics, it became clear that Eliminating that identity through sound of the gender of the candidate increased the chances of female candidates in making it to the next round by 50%. Just being able to hear who the candidate is by the clacking of heels can influence by 50% the chances of you advancing the next round. Let me illustrate another example. Here's someone called Abby Conant. She was selected by one of those blind auditions, to be a, a principal trombonist, the top instrumentalist in that section, in the very famous Munich Philharmonic Orchestra. This happened in 1980. And people who listened to her said, by far, she was the best musician, a group of hundreds who auditioned for that prized seat in the Munich Philharmonic Orchestra. After her audition, the orchestra's then and guest conductor said, that's who we want. After they made the selection, still not knowing the gender of the successful trombonist, the selection committee was shocked to discover that the winner, that amazing trombonist, was female. In fact, when they called her onto the stage, they invited her as Herr Conant, thinking that the trombonist must be a male. For the next 13 years, even though she won the seat, they were very difficult. She was actively discriminated by conductors and by fellow musicians. Even though she won the principal trombonist seat, she was demoted to a second trombone section, and they refused to give her solos, even though that would typically go with a principal trombone seat. She sued the Philharmonic for discrimination, and she won. She sued for back pay because she discovered that even though she was the most talented trombonist in that orchestra, that she made far less than her male colleagues in lower sections. You can read about her story in Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink. And it shows that even though you can address the entry point into a prestigious position or an award, through a blind, gender-neutral process, that women who make it to the next step still face additional barriers, discrimination, and not so subtle, even if they overcome those initial barriers. 
Because of that discrimination, the initial discrimination that causes women to be rejected at the start of their careers, the discrimination once they overcome those hurdles, many drop out along the way in what's called the leaky pipeline. The leaky pipeline is a metaphor used to describe the phenomenon that members of a specific demographic group, why they can't continue progressing from one point in their career, a trainee stage, to being a full-blown professional recognized with awards. Leaking out of the pipeline refers to this problem. In other words, it's like you're pouring water into a pipe. Young boys and girls, and they progress through the pipe, hopefully in a fair, unbiased process. But what actually happens, if you actually look at the data, is that girls and women leak along this pipeline. And so it, when you get to the end of the pipe, women are underrepresented. They don't emerge in the most competitive jobs. They aren't recognized with the most prestigious awards. They're not invited to be members of the most prestigious honorific societies. The leaking pipeline theory is often also attributed to women in STEM. Just a couple of days ago, prior to yesterday's International Day, we held something called hashtag Women in Science, YVR. And 200 of us talked about what we can do about this issue. According to the National Science Foundation in the United States, nearly 50% of people searching for jobs in sciences and engineering are women. That reflects the fact that women are actually, in many cases, the majority of students in some of these areas, especially in biology and the natural sciences. But if you actually follow them along that pipeline, even though the supply is there at the end, as they go through the promotion and tenure process, at the end, only 15% of them are women. And this is something that we as a university here at UBC and at universities around the world must deal with because it is an internal problem. The problem also affects funding agencies, such as the Tri-Councils or the National Institutes of Health in the United States. Now, if you're competitive enough, enough to get a, a faculty position in a great university, you then have to secure grant funding from the Tri-Councils in Canada or for, from similar granting agencies around the world. But if you actually look at success rates and the amount of money that is granted to successful scientists, STEM faculty members. The data show that first-time ma male grantees selected through the same mechanism get forty dollars to $50,000 more per grant than the equally qualified female first-time grantee. The problem, as you can see, isn't in the lack of people or ability, it's actually a fundamental issue of discrimination. A refusal to acknowledge and to honor the accomplishments of women the same way the system and granting agencies honor the accomplishments of men. Dame Jocelyn, one of the great early physicists in Britain, remarked when she became a full professor in the UK that when she was actually appointed professor of physics, that she doubled the number of female professors of physics in the entire United Kingdom. She's an astrophysicist who herself was passed over for a Nobel Prize for her discovery of radio, radio pulsars, still something that's considered to be worthy of a Nobel Prize. She said, if a third of Argentinian astrophysicists are women, it doesn't seem to me there's a problem with women having the brains to continue in this field. It's something to do with the culture in this country that results in this disparity. The limiting factor is culture, not women's brains or abilities. And I regret that it's still necessary to say that in this nation. There's a pressing need to challenge gender discrimination ingrained in cultures, not only there in Argentina, but here in Canada, in the United States, all around the world. I believe it's one of the major problems that still has to be dealt with. Throughout this talk, I've been mentioning some of the countless women who have had challenges in terms of discrimination, even though they are tremendously able. 
Here are just a couple more examples. Here on this slide, you can see a pretty famous photograph of the actual scientists and actresses who portrayed them in the award-winning movie, Hidden Figures. These women who worked for NASA in the 50s and 60s were absolutely instrumental, as you know, if you've seen the movie, for the success, launch, and completion of the Apollo 11 mission. Were it not for them, even though they have not been celebrated adequately, these transformational missions would have been failures. Hidden Figures in the Margot Shetlerly book, it's based on, illustrates the challenges and discrimination that this, these women faced while they were working, while they were rescuing these missions. And they were very, very late in receiving recognition that was so sorely due to them. This is how long they had to wait. Catherine Gobble was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2015 at the age of 97. Unfortunately, many other women were not lucky to even receive late recognition. Here you can see a remarkable person who a physicist referred to as the first lady of physics. Her name is Chen Xiong Wu. She didn't receive fame and recognition. Her male colleagues, Xian Yang and Chang Dao Li, accomplished physicists, no doubt. They won the Nobel Prize for theorizing that parity may not exist with beta decay. But it was Wu, shown here, who proved the theory. She did not win the Nobel Prize. Now, if you look at Mary Bracamont in the area of fine arts, there are three, a group of three artists called Les Trois Grandes Dames, three great ladies. Those were Berthe Morisot, Marie Cassat, and Marie Bracamont. All of them were extraordinary artists, as you can see if you look at the painting there in the slide. Absolutely gorgeous. If you look at it in a blind way, you'd want to have it in your house or see it in a gallery just as much as men who have been celebrated in the most esteemed galleries. And artists of the time, such as Monet and Degas, who have become celebrated, recognized her talent. And in fact, her husband, also an accomplished painter, Felix, grew resentful, her own husband, of her talents and the recognition from Monet and Degas. And sadly, an example of the leaky pipe. Because of her husband's resentment, she quit painting. And very little is known about her. And she was discovered because of a short, unpublished biography written by her loving son, Pierre. And how about lucrative business products? Well, here's a a picture of someone you've never heard of, Lizzie Maggie. She invented a game called The Landlords in 1904. It was something that was really focused on wealth, on colonialism, monopolies. Well, 30 years after she invented this interesting game, there was a guy called Charles Darrow who took that idea, essentially the whole game design, and she, he sold it to Parker Brothers. He didn't give any credit to the actual inventor of the game, Lizzie Maggie, and gave the name a different name, Monopoly. And as you know, Parker Brothers later sold that game to 300, many peop 300 million people, and Charles Darrow became a very wealthy man. And to recognize... Lizzie's initial contribution in inventing the game, Parker Brothers felt that it was sufficient to give her $500 and no royalties. Can you believe that? And as of today, as I said, very, very, very few people have ever heard of Lizzie Maggie. There's a similar lack of recognition in sports. This is someone that many of you may know because you're here in Canada. This is uh, Haley Wickenhauser, and um, she's one of the few women who've actually been recognized uh, 
in her role in running a sports enterprise. And it really is still a problem today. If you look across youth sports, if you look across uh, sports uh, in different countries at the varsity level, or look at professional sports, a University of Toronto researcher, Janessa Manuel, said that only 16% of head coaches in Canadian universities, and only 16% of Canadian national teams have coaches that are women, even women's sports. Haley is, is, is uh, one of those pioneers where has broken through that discrimination, and she is part of Canada's working group on gender equity in sports. And that's a very, very important working group that hopefully will break the glass ceiling that gets in the way of more women athletes becoming coaches of the sports that they excel in. There's similar efforts going on in a lot of other fields. We cannot be complacent, whether we're talking about women in STEM, or sports, music, or the arts, or the movie industry. Gender inequality persists in almost every profession. I'm here to say it diminishes institutions, universities, entire professions, entire regions, entire nations, and in fact, the entire world. Sadly, while there has been some progress towards gender equity in certain sectors, gender inequality is still the norm. And in some places of the world, is still increasing. There's little progress also here at home. It's about time we change that. It is everyone's responsibility. And every man and woman, but especially men in prominent positions, have to take action and dress to address the situation if the, if the situation is going to improve. Let me give you some examples. A positive note, um, there have been some steps that have been taken. We have, as I said, co-hosted, co-hosted the Women in Science, Health, and Innovation Conference here in Vancouver involving the nations of France, Germany, Netherlands, Switzerland, UK, the US, and Canada. It's a first step. But the clear message at the conference two days ago is that we have so much work yet to do. It holds true for this university. It holds true for this nation. It holds true for the entire world. We cannot be complacent. But there are some men that I want to mention that have been leading the charge. For example, Otto Hahn, the co-discoverer of nuclear fission, nominated his research colleague shown here in this slide, Lise Meitner, for the Nobel Prize over 10 times, over and over again. She was nominated also by others like Max Planck, Niels Bohr, Werner Heisenberg, Max Born. But despite the efforts of these noblists, the efforts of Meitner, Hahn, and other scientists, she never won the Nobel Prize, even though they hashtag nominated her. And here's one of the three Nobel winners in physics, someone who is a household name, Marie Curie. And the man that was behind her Nobel Prize, it's particularly poignant in contrast to Felix, the artist who was jealous of his wife. Pierre Curie refused to accept the Nobel Prize in physics unless his research partner and wife, Marie Curie, was also awarded a prize. And this finally made her the first woman to ever win a Nobel Prize in physics. But she was an exception. Only, as I say, two other women have ever won a Nobel Prize in physics, including the one this year, to Donna Strickland. And only one has ever won the prize in economics. All this can seem a little discouraging, and that's not what this is about. It's not meant to discourage. It's meant to rally everyone who is listening to this talk to action. First, we need to, in all of our institutions, all of our nations, all of these different professions, honestly address the barriers that women face in winning awards, in winning seats, in winning promotion and tenure, 
to recognize them honestly and fairly for their accomplishments in the workplace. We need to step up and challenge discrimination anywhere we see it. And the men have to take the lead to allow more women the space in the workplace and the ability to return after they give birth to kids and take care of them. There needs to be a mechanism for them to re-enter careers. And second, more men have to help out in the home, taking care of the kids, so that women and men have the same opportunity to focus on their careers. Second, in the institutions, whether it's a university or orchestra or a company, we all need to set up mentorship schemes so that women, like men, have the same kinds of mentoring opportunities that are fundamentally important in the progression and success of individuals in any institution. Third, we need to make ourselves aware of our biases and attack these unconscious biases that prevent women from being hired, promoted, or from receiving recognition and awards. We need to take the example of blind auditions and orchestras and to scale that to every selection process, regardless of what the profession might be, because we know it works. And lastly, and this is uh, something really meant for men, hashtag nominate her, wherever and whenever possible, especially in the situations where it's clear that there is underrepresentation of women. The consequences are grave. If we fall short on this very basic responsibility as leaders, we are doing a great disservice to the world. So you might want to ask the question, why? Why do I care? Well, part of the reason I care is because of all the amazing students, women, at the University of British Columbia. But it's far more personal than that, I have to be honest. I want my daughters to live in a more equalized world where they can be acknowledged based upon their merit rather than their gender. We must all fight for gender equity so that no woman is excluded or discouraged from a field that she excels in, so that no breakthroughs are lost through the barriers of sexism, and no one who deserves a chance is passed up because they are female. We owe it to the next generation to take steps to ensure that every girl today can fulfill her potential tomorrow. Nominate her. Thank you very much.